Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christine Liggio with the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement here at Lemoyne College. A welcome and thank you all to our alumni, our parents, our students, and our friends for joining us this afternoon. Um, as part of our Insights from the Heights series, we are extremely fortunate to have Lemoyne College alumnus Mark Temnitsky, class of 2015, joining us today for this timely and uh, truly important uh, discussion about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, Mark is also going to be joined in conversation by um, Dr. Anurban um, Acharya, uh, Professor of Practice here at Lemoyne College in the Department of Political Science, and also Dr. Edward Judge, Professor Emeritus of History, and also an expert on uh, Russian history, who's going to be moderating the discussion. Let's share a little bit about our moderator before we begin. Um, Dr. Judge earned his PhD in history from the University of Michigan in 1975. He conducted research in Russia in 1976 through 1977, and he taught at Lemoyne from 1978 until his retirement in 2018. Uh, during his 40 year tenure at Lemoyne, Dr. Judge offered a series of courses in world history since 1900, Russian history and world civilizations. And while teaching at Lemoyne, Dr. Judge received the Monsignor A. Robert Casey Teacher of the Year Award, the Richard M. Uh, McKeon Scholar of the Year Award, the Joseph C. George Endowed Professorship, and the Matteo Ricci Award for Achievement in Diversity. Um, Dr. Judge also enjoys historical research and writing. He has authored and co-authored numerous books and publications over the years, uh, focusing on Imperial Russia, the Cold War, um, uh, world history and anti-colonialism, to name a few. And so we're really fortunate to have, have him here with us uh, today as well. Before I turn things over to Dr. Judge, I'd like to mention that we will open the conversation up for Q&A. Um, so please send along your questions using the chat function. We did receive a lot of questions in advance. So we will do the best we can to fill as many questions as we can today. Um, and lastly, we are recording today's uh, program and we will share it with all of you as soon as we can in a follow-up email. So without further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Ed Judge, and I'm going to turn things over to him. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Ed. Oh, thank you, Christine, and hi, everyone. Last, uh, last July, Russian President Vladimir Putin published a long article entitled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. In it, he argued extensively that Russians and Ukrainians are historically one and the same people, and he even referred to Ukraine as Little Russia. When I read it, I found it very biased and ominous, and I noted that it was a very different version of Ukrainian history from the one presented in an excellent honors thesis that I had the privilege of directing at Lemoyne College seven or eight years ago. The author of that thesis, Mark Timnitsky, is our main speaker today. After graduating from Lemoyne in 2015, Mark went on to earn master's degrees in public administration and international relations from the prestigious Maxwell School at Syracuse University. Since then, he has made a career of studying, lecturing, and writing about Eastern Europe for publications such as the New York Times and Forbes, and for institutions like the Atlantic Council, the Wilson Center, and the Center for European Policy Analysis, is a freelance journalist and a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. He speaks fluent Ukrainian and has made many visits to his ancestral homeland. His talk will cover Russia and Ukraine since 2013, and I am quite sure that his perspective will be different from Putin's. Mark? Dr. Judge, thank you as always for that wonderful introduction and thank you to the Lemoyne community for hosting this timely event and it's nice to see so many familiar faces. So to give some context on the second Russian invasion of Ukraine, I will go through a very brief presentation, but we would like to save as much time as possible for questions for our participants. So without further ado, I will get started. Okay, so context. Many reporters as well as news outlets and some Russian information, misinformation has been stating that the current conflict is because of NATO expansion in Eastern Europe. And this is not the case. It actually goes back to 2013 when Ukraine was speaking with the European Union about the potential of having an association agreement. This would make economic relations stronger between the two entities. So at the time, Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych 
had been working with European Union officials, but he was pro-Russian leaning. And because of pressure from Russian President Vladimir Putin, he decided that he would not sign this association agreement. The Ukrainian people were not satisfied with this decision. A few days after his decision not to sign this agreement, students gathered to Ukraine's Maidan or Central Square where they protested. The president had been beaten by the police forces and this caught attention in the country. As a result, thousands and perhaps even millions of Ukrainian residents all over the country gathered to this area and this became known as the Euromaidan protest. This would last from November 2013 to February 2014 and it gained international news. Many US politicians as well as European politicians came to meet with Ukrainian opposition leaders and they even spoke on the stage that they had set up at the Central Square, one of whom was Senator John McCain. At this point, President Yanukovych realized that he had lost his support of the people and he had ordered Ukrainian special forces to fire upon these peaceful protesters, believing that this would make them disrupt and, and leave the situation. Unfortunately, this led to the deaths of over 100 people. They are known as the Heavenly Hundred. And as you can see here on the, the map, right behind this hotel, which is in, where the snipers were shooting many of these people, they have a little chapel built here now in honor of the Heavenly Hundred. And, and they were commemorated for their bravery uh, uh, as they were fighting to support democracy within Ukraine. Realizing he had made a mistake, President Yanukovych fled in, in the early hours of the night on a helicopter where he now lives in Russia. The Ukrainian parliament then voted to impeach him. And as a result, the Russians claimed that this new government was illegit illegitimate, that was perhaps going after Russian speaking and ethnic Russian peoples, which simply was not true. And it annexed the Crimean Peninsula in March 2014. Then in April 2014, armed militants in the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts or provinces took over their central government buildings and they declared their independence. The Ukrainian government responded by declaring a counter operation against these people. And unfortunately, this has led to the first conflict that began in 2014. Since 2014, over 14,000 Ukrainian soldiers, Russian soldiers, as well as ethnic Ukrainian and Russian ethnic communities in eastern Ukraine have perished, and there are nearly 1.6 million displaced people, or close to 2 million people who were displaced in Ukraine since 2014. And this was the first Russian invasion, so, so this is not new. Why has this happened? So unfortunately, in Ukraine's history, has been fighting for independence for hundreds of years. In western Ukraine, these cities and the Ukrainian people were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and eventually when the Nazis took over. Whereas Southern and, and Eastern Ukraine have predominantly been part of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. What we now know as modern Ukraine was not formed until after the Second World War when the Soviet Union combined these different parts of Ukraine into one country. Then Premier Nikita Khrushchev in the 1950s was also an ethnic Ukrainian, and there is a rumor that he was celebrating and, and had a commemoration with the Communist Party in Ukraine, and because of his ancestral roots, he gave the Crimean Peninsula to the Ukrainian state rather than to the Russian Federation, something that the Russians dispute as well. After the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the Ukrainians had to decide how they would want to pursue their future. As I stated, parts of Ukraine had been part of the Russian Empire since the 1700s, and it was part of the Soviet Union. And then it needed to decide, did it want to continue its relationship with the Russia or continue moving westward? Ukraine has been a very interesting case in that it has tried to play off the benefits of, of both countries and try to maintain some sort of neutral status. But as Russia has continued to meddle in Ukrainian affairs, as well as occupying parts of its territory, and now the second invasion, the Ukrainians now have very strong support with Western integration. And as Dr. Judge mentioned, President Putin is trying to legitimize his second invasion of Ukraine by stating that Ukrainians and Russians 
are one people and, and he would go as far as saying that the Belarusians as well are, are all part of the same community as he tries to unite these different territories to try to make some sort of new formal large Russian entity. As I stated, the Crimean Peninsula has always been disputed by the Russians as Nikita Khrushchev gave it over to what is now Ukraine. And for context, when Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, the Russians implemented this form of, of government called Russification. And, and these policies were to try to eliminate the Ukrainian language. Now, this went, of course, beyond Ukraine. It was also implemented in, in the Caucasus as well as the Central Asian states and Belarus, where the belief was to make all of these people Russian speaking, they would practice Russian traditions, values, etc., by trying to eliminate the languages of these people. Of course, these efforts were unsuccessful as there is a country called Ukraine of 41 million people, as well as 20 million ethnic diaspora Ukrainians worldwide. So that is just one segment of, of showing how Russification failed. And this has been an ongoing battle between the Russian government and, and the people that are its neighbors in the region. Now, when the Russians annexed Crimea in March of 2014, they claimed, as I stated, that they were going to save ethnic Russian, Russian-speaking people in Ukraine. This was not the case, as many ethnic-speaking and Russian-speaking people were in Ukraine's government, who also voted to impeach President Yanukovych. So these, these information that Putin is trying to put out is simply not true. Another important thing to add is when Ukraine had this territory annexed and the Russians stated that there was a referendum for Crimea to join Russia, there were many ballot boxes packed and truck shipping ballots that had been cast before the polls had even opened. And it was some abs absurd number that 27% of the peninsula had voted to join Russia. So this is another example of not only Russian meddling by sending soldiers to occupy territory, but also fabricating elections. And then the Russians had a constitutional re referendum in July 2020, where there were roughly 400 new amendments made to the constitution, one of which was that Crimea had officially now been recognized by the Russian Duma and the Russian government as part of the Russian Federation. Unfortunately, we are now in Russia's second invasion of Ukraine, which began on February 24th. According to the United Nations, there are now over 2 million Ukrainian refugees who have fled from Ukraine, in addition to the 1.6 that, that became displaced persons in 2014. If this number continues, the RAND Corporation and some other think tanks here in Washington, D.C., as well as news outlets such as the Washington Post, believe that this number could go as high as 5 to 10 million people, which would make up roughly one-fifth or 20% of Ukraine's total population. This is a significant humanitarian and refugee crisis happening in Europe. In addition to that, the Russian government is denying its involvement in that it is claiming that it is helping, again, Russian speaking and ethnic Russian people in Ukraine. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian government has been working with European officials as well as the United States, and it provides a daily update on the war, stating how many Russian casualties there are, as well as forms of military equipment that have been destroyed. While it is possible some of these numbers are inflated, to date, it is estimated that roughly 12,000 Russian soldiers have died within two weeks, which nearly doubled the total amount of deaths between 2014 and the start of this year of the initial invasion. So this just shows how devastating and catastrophic Putin's poor decision is. And of course, outside of the Russian soldiers who have died, thousands of Ukrainian soldiers are bravely, men and women are bravely defending their country and numerous civilians have been killed by these, for lack of a better word, Russian thugs. The international community has rallied heavily behind Ukraine's cause. Many countries have implemented stiff sanctions on the Russian Federation, banning certain banks from the SWIFT 
system, which is an international monetary system that many countries use, as well as implementing sanctions on high ranking Russian officials to prevent them from traveling to the West, seizing their assets, or even in some cases, selling their assets back to other people. Unfortunately, Putin has a belief that he wants to be remembered as one of the greatest rulers of Russia of all time, and he is committed to his cause in Ukraine. Who are the main actors? As we discussed, Ukraine is the primary focus in this unfortunate event. But there is some good news. If Ukraine has been able to defend itself from Russia over the last two weeks, and if this continues, it will be able to show that the Russian government and its military are not as strong as many believed initially. If Ukraine is also able to join the European Union, it would send a strong message to other former Soviet states that a path towards joining the West is possible. Alternatively, if Russia is successful in its events, it would show that Russia is able to meddle in the affairs of its neighbors without consequence, as stated, while the West has implemented numerous economic sanctions in Russia, this is not deterred them or altered the Russian government's behavior of meddling in the affairs of its neighbors as well as internationally. Recent changes to the Russian constitution would also allow President Putin to remain in power until 2036. Meanwhile, as we move west, the European Union is a strong member. The European Union will be voting on potential candidate status for Ukraine later this week. And if Ukraine is successfully admitted as a candidate, this could pave the way as well to Georgia and Moldova who are also seeking candidate status. This would help tremendously their economies as well as greater integration between these countries. Ukraine could also give back to the European Union as it has a strong information technology sector, numerous engineers and technicians who would be able to contribute in the digital age. And Ukraine has the fortune of having visa-free travel to the Eurozone, meaning that its citizens can travel within Europe for 70 to 90 days without requiring visas. It makes it easier to travel. And finally, the United States is heavily involved. Ukrainian engineers and scientists work frequently with Americans here on different aerospace technology, which goes a long way for our militaries. Now, what's at stake? If Ukraine is able to successfully deter Russia and become a Western country, it will pave the way towards a greater relationship with Ukraine and the European Union, as well as preventing, presenting new economic opportunities and life for Ukrainians. A statistic in 2018 stated that the average monthly salary in the United States or the European Union was roughly $2,000 US, while in Ukraine it was $250 a month. If Ukraine is able to join an economic relationship with the European Union, this could help boost Ukraine's economy. It would provide additional jobs and, and economic incentives and opportunities for these people so that they can have similar livelihoods that we have here in the West. Now, if Russia is able to hold the territory it has, it could send a message to other international aggressive countries that they would be able to successfully meddle in the affairs of its neighbors without much consequence. But Russia has faced even harsher sanctions as of late, and some of these international states are being very hesitant working with the Russians. So for example, the United Nations hosted a referendum last week condemning the Russian annexation and invasion of Ukraine, and China was one of the countries that abstained from the vote. This would show that perhaps the Chinese are trying to view and see how the events unfold before they, they pursue similar, perhaps, options in its area. And second order consequences. So there has been a large population decline in Ukraine since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Many Ukrainians between college age and their early 40s are leaving Ukraine, as I said, for greater economic opportunities and escaping now the conflict. So many of these citizens have moved westward, westward, which as a result leads to a brain drain in Ukraine as many of these young educated individuals are leaving the country. Russia's invasion also has changed public opinions in Ukraine about Western integration. Prior to the Euromaidan movement in the first and second Russian invasions, many Ukrainians were hesitant with 
European Union relations, and particularly with NATO. They wanted nothing to do with NATO. They wanted to maintain a, a neutral status. But as the invasions occurred, more and more support happened for these organizations, where Ukraine now submitted a formal application to join the EU last week, and EU members will be voting on Ukraine's potential candidate status as early as tomorrow. This is a huge change in the course of just eight years. Finally, with Ukraine's NATO efforts, NATO conducts annual exercises with the Ukrainians each year. Ukraine also has an enhanced opportunities partner status with NATO, meaning that it interacts frequently with one another. And President Zelensky of Ukraine has been pushing NATO officials to invite Ukraine in some capacity with at a minimum providing a membership action plan that would help the Ukrainians become part of this organization. So ironically, President Putin wanted to have a stronger relationship with Ukraine, and instead he has done the exact opposite. He's managed to Ukraine, managed to unite ethnic Russian and Russian-speaking peoples, as well as ethnic Ukrainian and Ukrainian-speaking peoples in Ukraine. The country is united, and they are moving westward. So lessons learned, as we've seen, the international community is providing assistance. Of course, it can always do more, and President Putin, of course, is meddling again in one of its neighboring states. So I hope that this gives a good overview of the situation. As aside from implementing sanctions on Russia, international states have also been providing a lot of humanitarian and financial aid to Ukraine, and particularly lethal weapons that the Ukrainians can use while they defend themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that was uh, very helpful, very interesting, impressive, informative, and as I expected, it provided a perspective that is a bit more enlightened and enlightening than that of Mr. Putin. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Anurban Acharya of the Lemoyne Department of Political Science. He holds master's degrees in political science and economics, an MPhil in developmental studies, and a doctoral degree in political science from the Maxwell School. His areas of expertise include international political economy, international relations, South Asian politics, and US foreign policy. His forthcoming book is called The Right to Sell, Markets, Capitalism, and Urban Space in India. He is a recipient of Lemoyne's Ignatian Mission Award and is perhaps best known around here as a panelist on a local Friday night PBS talk show known as the Ivory Tower, Anurban. Thank you, Dr. Judge, that for this incredibly generous uh, introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us in this uh, time, dark times of war. Um, I will take five minutes of your time to kind of think about what would be possible paths to peace. So I'm going to share my slide right now. Um, I hope you can see the slides. Um, so. I have been reading a lot because I'm teaching international relations right now. We and our students, uh, I and our students are constantly talking about this. Um, and I just wanted to think about what are possibilities that we ha I have learned from um, uh, studying conflict resolution and, uh, and international politics, uh, perhaps a little bit of history uh, of what could be done. Um, now, I just uh, start with some parameters of freedom, and this definitely talks to Mark's uh, um, uh, reference towards the consolidation of uh, Ukrainian democracy. Uh, so global freedom scores, puts, uh, which is uh, done by the Freedom House Index, um, it scores Ukraine at 61 as partly free, but again, the large, another largest democracy in the world, India, is also 66. There has been a general decline in uh, democracies around the world. Russia is definitely 19, not free. Uh, and in terms of democracy scores, which is a score that Freedom House gives for um, uh, 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 transitional economies, uh, uh, Ukraine is at 39 as a transitional or a hybrid regime and is kind of a middle income country. Now, why I'm saying this is because it gives the Ukraine the profile for consolidating democracy and moving towards a more market democracy um, uh, in the form of EU. So I asked the question, what would be the peace process? 
Um, as the previous slides show that Ukraine is in the process, as I said, of democratic consolidation, uh, politically and economically. But non-neutrality might not be possible, especially when it comes to collective security. Uh, and uh, when I say non-neutrality, it also in terms of larger forms of military alliance. Uh, the reasoning is as follows. Putin has showed very, very, very clearly that uh, it is going to imperially aggress on Ukraine's sovereign soil um, uh, with, for any signals that it can concoct or think of. Uh, and it reminds me of the 2008 issue of, uh, there was some chatter about Ukraine um, joining NATO. And again, these are signals that Putin interprets. Um, and, he sh and he has shown that he is going to go militarily against this. More tellingly, however, uh, NATO um, has also shown very clearly that its member states will not engage militarily to defend Ukraine from Russian imperial aggression. These are just facts on the ground. Ukrainian people are thus, um, in terms of parlances of war, are left to help themselves, and they are doing so with tremendous human and material cost. Um, so as a scholar, as a person who is committed to truth and peace, um, we must ask what is the morality of encouraging or assisting to fight without fighting with, or how much burden of human suffering must we bear in our hearts without offering avenues of lasting peace. So uh, Ukraine wants definitely an end to this Russian aggression and meddling at its borders, long-term economic aid and institutional reform. Uh, again, non-neutrality that I've kept it as a question because it is a sense of debate among the international community uh, um, of scholars and observers. And what Putin wants, and he has said this again and again, is demilitarization uh, of Ukraine, which is completely bizarre and unacceptable um, by any norm of international law and standards. Um, it wants uh, Ukraine to denazify, which is again, a very ambiguous claim Yes, I, I teach understanding modern terrorism and other kinds of movements, social movements, and it is very well documented by U.S. Army college reports, humanitarian organizations, and uh, news reports prominently around the world that Ukraine has neo-Nazi, white supremacist, far-right, nativist, nationalist, whatever you call it, that kind of presence, and groupings, they do exist in Ukraine, and Ukrainian people have been resisting them, uh, like in any other civil society, um, and, you know, these kinds of groupings exist uh, anywhere and many places in the West and has been on the rise. So it is up to Ukraine to decide which parties or associations it can ban from public life. It is none of, the, none of Russia's business to uh, meddle in the internal political matters of Ukraine. But as I showed in the first slide, as a transitional hybrid democracy regime, it is in the best interest of Ukraine to allow certain rights of minorities um, in order to join the democratic tradition. Um, now, the sticking point is Crimea. Um, I recently uh, heard that Russia is uh, uh, saying that uh, one of the things that they now want is that Crimea should be allowed uh, or, or recognized as a sovereign as a part of uh, Russian sovereign territory. Um, and I do believe that uh, this is a signal for a de-escalation because uh, Crimea by all means belongs or is controlled by Russia. There is, there is no, the facts on the ground simply prove that. Uh, now what can happen, however, is that there might be democratically held referendums or some kind of a political process of self-determination that can decide what can happen in Crimea. So I would uh, you know, um, uh, see these as, at the lack of a better word, as a lose-lose situation, but at the same time, it does not ascend to Russia or give Russia any more uh, than um, it already has. Um, and it also, most importantly, takes away or at least moves towards a path of um, no human suffering from the part of people in Russia, in Ukraine, and in, in many other parts of the world, because we live in a globally connected world. So that brings us to sanctions. And yes, sanctions are a way to deter. Um, it, it, they, they are uh, uh, seen as nonviolent ways, but... Um, 
if as a political economist, uh, a student of political economy, I would say it's not necessarily non-violent in that sense, because it does hurt people politically and economically. There are people in Russia right now who are being hassled, heckled by Putin's regime. Uh, thousands of them are trying to even leave or, or not engage with the regime at all. Uh, and just so we know that they also cannot, you know, uh, if they want to do an international purchase in Visa, MasterCard, and so on, they simply can't, right? Um, um, this has larger implications in terms of decoupling of financial systems. It brings into motif this kind of West versus East uh, showdown, which Henry Kissinger had uh, warned us against. Um, and it will have global repercussions in terms of wheat. Uh, you know, if we go back um, uh, to the Arab Spring, one of the reasons where massive, um, um, you know, fire in uh, wheat harvests in Russia, uh, which Egypt depends upon. Um, and so we are yet to see what global repercussions are there. Uh, but uh, yes, the rest of the world uh, would bear this burden uh, to the extent that there is some de-escalation, uh, and I don't know what is in Putin's mind. I can only think about, um, uh, you know, in terms of my expertise, what are possible solutions uh, to both parties. And I will end by saying, as a moral person committed against uh, imperial aggression and war, we should grieve and help every life fleeing war without the color of their passports. And we must morally resist all imperial wars of aggression, regardless of who commits it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anavan. That was very interesting, very thoughtful, uh, very informative. Uh, when you were talking about neo-Nazis, it struck me that uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine is a Russian speaking Jew. So to refer to him as a neo Nazi is just absolutely absurd, absolutely insane. Anyway, that concludes our presentation portion. And we'd like to open the conversation up now to questions, to QA. And Christine will help us with that. If I may, I'd like to interject and add two more things. Ukraine's previous prime minister was Jewish, President Zelensky is Jewish. His current prime minister is Jewish. And when the parliament had its elections in 2019, the far right sector earned nationally 2%. They hold zero seats in parliament. So this Russian propaganda that the Ukrainian government is filled with neo-Nazis is simply not true. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you um, so much. Um, <laughs> Dr. Judge, yes, we did receive several questions and we have a few also in the chat. Um, so the first one I wanted to start with, and I know I, any of you could answer this, but uh, the first one I'd like to start with is, are you seeing any patterns and similarities with the current conflict that lead up to World War I or World War II? Well, sorry, I, oh, sorry go ahead. Uh, let, me, let me start this by saying that the first two years of what we call World War II, what we now call World War II from 1939 to 1941, were known as Hitler's War because it was internationally recognized that no matter what other mistakes other nations, Britain and France and others had made, the war happened because Adolf Hitler wanted it to happen. And I think I suppose one similarity here is this war that is going on right now is Putin's war. Whatever mistakes NATO and the United States and Ukraine may have made, it is happening because Putin wants it to happen. Mark, Enerbon, anybody want to add anything? Uh, yes, I, I do want to add that um, this is a very personalized war. I agree that um, um, I had argued elsewhere before that in terms of international politics, it is best for Putin to not go into this war at all. And uh, against every, you know, he proved that thousands of us around the world wrong, saying that, no, I am going to go to war. And, uh, and again, I guess he hasn't read Clausewitz, you know, the deadly combination 
of emotion, uh, uh, you know, interest and uh, chance is going against him. Uh, but I don't know whether it will escalate into a wider war, especially because I am seeing that big countries and democracies that are economic powerhouses on their own right, like, for example, India and China are abstaining from the vote. Um, um, uh, uh, but I do think there is a way as an off ramp um, in terms of non neutrality and one of the concessions could be that there might not be any missiles in uh, Ukraine, which is a similar kind of arrangement that uh, United States has with Cuba. Uh, but I, I don't see this going because especially because Putin is shown that this very quick war that was supposed to happen is not happening at all. Uh, and he's getting bogged down by not just state organizations, international organizations and private companies, right? Uh, and again, we, those have um, uh, adverse effects on people. Uh, so, you know, to answer the question, I don't think it will escalate into a wider worldwide conflict. And I will add that I hope you are right. I hope and pray to God that you are right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the next question, um... Mark, I know that you spoke to this in your presentation a little bit, but I was wondering if you could elaborate. Um, an audience member writes in to ask, is the Russian military might not as strong as we perceived it to be? I know that you spoke about that in your presentation. Can you, is there anything that you could add to our perception of the Russian military? Yeah, absolutely. So as, as my fellow panelists and friends stated that President Putin thought that he was going to walk into Russia. So According to reports I received from the Ukrainian embassy, but also Bellingcat, which is an international agency that collects information, Putin launched his war on February 27th, a Thursday, and he wanted to take care of the Ukrainian capital by February 28th, so roughly five days. The conflict is now, Russia's war rather, has been going on for two weeks. And it's very, very commendable how well the Ukrainians have been able to defend themselves from the Russian armed forces. There are a few reasons this is the case. First of all, for whatever reason, the Russians aren't really using their aircraft properly, and the Ukrainians have been able to destroy numerous jets, UAVs, helicopters, as well as tanks, etc., relatively quickly. There are also somewhat comical reports that as the Russians are invading Ukraine, their tanks and other military hardware are running out of gasoline. So it's very hard to, I don't mean to make fun of the situation because it's very serious. I have family and friends there and it's a such situation, but the Russians are ill prepared and ill equipped to, to invade. And then something that the Ukrainians have that you can't steal from them is pride for their country and the grit that they want to defend their homeland without giving up to the Russians. Another significant contributing factor is the Ukrainians conduct several military exercises with NATO each year. NATO countries have also been providing advisors to Ukraine since 2014 to help them modernize their military forces as well as reform their defense structure. So this has been able to help Ukraine prepare for a situation like this where they're able to interact with one another to the point where they're using perhaps Western tactics and combating the Russian forces while Russia is more of the old style military invasions that you would have had in World War II or some of these older conflicts. And I, I might just add a little historical perspective. You never really know how good an army or armed forces are until you actually deploy them. And some of us who have been around for a while will remember back in 1979 when the Soviet army invaded Afghanistan uh, they moved very quickly and very impressively and within several days had taken Kabul and carried out regime change, uh, got rid of the old leader and put in a, a leader who was pro-Soviet. And then they got bogged down for 10 years in a war that they finally, they Gorbachev finally ended up leaving in uh, 1989 uh, with effectively a Soviet defeat. And of course, the United States has more recently had similar experiences in Afghanistan. 
so for to try to control and pacify a country where the people have pride, where the people are willing to fight, and where the people are being supplied with modern weapons from elsewhere is a difficult task for any military power, uh, no matter how large, how strong, and how wealthy. Um, great, thank you. Um, for the next question, um, I'd like to ask, um, as we've seen suggested in the media, do you see, do you think that China is watching this conflict play out with an eye toward taking Taiwan? And how realistic is that? I know there's been a few questions in the chat also um, surrounding China, you know, might they intervene to restrict Russia? That was another question that came up. Uh, I don't know if this is best for Mark or Anurban, if, if each of you wanted to add in, that's, um, I, we could maybe start with Mark. Okay, thank you. So experts initially believed that the Chinese would intentionally be hesitant to respond to the conflict as they wanted to see how the international community would respond to Russia. And I think it is fair to say that no one expected such a strong support from the international community in support of Ukraine. This has gone as far as the Chinese from last week's UN resolution condemning Russia. China and Russia usually cooperate with one another on these, these voting processes. So that's, that's of significance. Another important matter is that some Chinese banks have now stopped interacting and trading with Russian banks as, as well as sanctioning them as, as the international community has done. So I think the Chinese have realized how serious and significant this matter is. And they are realizing that if the, the Russians have been heavily sanctioned and the international community is starting to sever significant ties with the Russians, the Chinese don't want to have a, a similar consequence. China heavily relies on the international community for economic relations as well as the West with, with products made in China and it would be very damaging. So I think the Chinese are, are realizing perhaps it's best not to intervene in our area of the world as, as this conflict occurs. Yeah, so I, I would just want to add there that I, I along with uh, you know um, my colleagues have been talking to I, I don't do I do not think that China is wanting to invade uh, Taiwan uh, and and simply because of a cynical reason which is that China has significant control over Taiwan it doesn't want to escalate that into a full-fledged warfare where Taiwan would slip away um, in in more ways than one uh, so I don't think uh, China is going to intervene in, in that way. Uh, uh, but I also think this abstention is quite important because, uh, it, you know, Russia has, has a significant alliance or at least has a, some kind of uh, understanding with China, but it's not coming around supporting the outright aggression into a sovereign territory. I guess I would just add that much as Putin's behavior has managed to alienate most people in uh, Ukraine, that uh, Xi Jinping's behavior in uh, Hong Kong has managed to frighten and alienate many people in Taiwan. So that makes things more difficult for China rather than easier. Thank you all uh, for that. Um, I'd like to now ask a question from our uh, president, Linda Lamura. Um, she writes, um, Syracuse has a significant uh, Ukrainian population. Um, the mayor and county executive wrote to Senator Schumer to encourage Ukrainian resettlement here. What are your thoughts about this in light of concerns about the brain drain? Um, but of course it would be um, a gift to welcome them here. Um, Mark, shall, shall we start with you? Certainly, so hi, Dr. Lamura, nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Uh, you are wonderful. So Lemoyne is very fortunate to have you. So as, as mentioned, Ukraine has a, or I'm sorry, Syracuse has a Ukrainian population here that's very active. Something that our church has been doing in the Syracuse area is gathering materials such as clothing, food, toiletries, basic necessities that Ukrainians need, and they're putting them up in packages and mailing it over there. So that's a way to, to assist these individuals. An unfortunate reality also is as we are now up to 2 million refugees in the span of two weeks, it's very likely that there will be millions of more 
people fleeing the country. So something that people can offer is when these Ukrainian refugees arrive to places such as Syracuse, providing them with perhaps places to stay or food or clothing that, that is no longer needed in your household, providing these uh, necessities to these individuals. Does anyone else have anything to add to that question? Um, thank you, Dr. Limura, for that um, question. I would not be in, a, in the capacity of uh, you know, answering to in terms of the brain drain, but I would like to request Mark if later on we have a list of, because uh, as you were saying before, one of uh, my colleagues sent me the NGO Razam who does a lot of work. Um, uh, good work for uh, and I have been uh, and then UNICEF and so if you can give a number of uh, kind of lists later on uh, which we can you know donate to uh, th that would be that would be really great um, and I do want to add that I'm hearing from New York Times that Biden administration has not been as liberal as they should have been in terms of allowing refugees in so I hope that that kind of policy on the cap of refugees change. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can only add from a selfish Lemoyne perspective that if we could get more students like, Lemoyne, like uh, Mark from uh, Ukraine, that would be awesome. Thank you. So I just put in a link to one of the organizations I know very well. It's called the Razum for Ukraine. Razum is Ukrainian word for together or being a community. And they're based in New York City. So they're, they're run by Americans or people such as myself. Americans of Ukrainian ancestry, Ukrainian Americans, who provide medical and other forms of assistance to Ukrainians. As the second invasion has happened, they've now expanded their efforts, but they are a legitimate source. All the donations that you provide them go strictly to Ukrainians in need. And it's, it's an unfortunate. There are many other wonderful organizations that, that are providing assistance, but it's important to note that some of the donations that you provide to those take a cut of the donation for their staff, whereas Erasm is providing every single dollar that you send to people in, in need over there. So if you're able to support Ukrainian-owned businesses or, or Ukrainian-American or Canadian-American, et cetera, uh, Canadian-Ukrainian, et cetera, it goes a long way, every dollar counts every contribution goes a long way. So, or even going to church, lighting a candle or going to your synagogue or mosque and, and thinking of, of Ukrainian people. And, and power of prayer is also very important. Thank you so much for that, Mark. Um, I know we received a lot of questions uh, from our uh, community about how can they help um, Ukraine. Um, of course, I think that that speaks volumes about our Lemoyne College community and our, and our Jesuit heritage. Um, so thanks for including some information about where people can donate, also mentioning the power of prayer. Um, but in addition to uh, donations and prayer, is are there anything else that are, um, citizens can do to help the Ukraine to help Ukraine and its challenges right now. Um, would contacting elected leaders help or does anything else come to mind that our community might be able to assist with? Yes, I think especially writing to congressional representatives goes a long way. Writing to your representatives and, and senators stating please continue to provide assistance to Ukraine. For example, President Biden had a address, an address at the White House yesterday announced that they're trying to push through a $12 billion humanitarian aid assistance to Ukraine that Congress has to pass. That's fantastic. That, that, that money will go a very long way with humanitarian efforts, financial efforts, uh, lethal assistance that the Ukrainians are providing. Something that we can write to our elected officials as well is asking administrations in Western countries to provide and continue to provide lethal assistance to the Ukrainians so they can defend themselves from Russia's war. This includes stingers and other forms of military hardware that can shoot down Russian aircraft or Russian tanks, providing them with ammunition, providing them with simple things that people don't think about, helmets and, and bulletproof vests and combat boots, et cetera, that, that soldiers will also re require. This may seem like a small thing and some people might find it uncomfortable, 
uh, but I think we should all be driving less. We should all be using less gasoline. We should all be turning the heat down in our house and using out na less natural gas because the supplies of energy in the world are going to be um, stressed, are, are already being stressed. And whatever we can do to relieve that stress, uh, using more uh, sustainable and renewable sources of energy uh, in the long run will help significantly. Thank you, Dr. Judge and, and Mark. I um, just want to draw your attention uh, to a comment in, in the chat by Chris Balderston, one of our alums. Um, he mentioned having been being involved in refugee efforts he said donations, of course, are key um, and sending money to groups like the Red Cross, the International Rescue Committee or Jose Andres World Central Kitchen have been really useful in those efforts. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and I know that we're getting pretty close to the top of the hour. Um, so I think for our last question, I wanted to end with a question from one of our students. Um, and she asked, what do you feel will be the lasting implications of the Ukraine invasion? I know from each of your perspectives, Mark, um, Dr. Judge and Dr. Akaria, you probably have different perspectives to share on that question. So I think for most of its history, Ukraine has tried to be an independent country just based on where it is geographically. And as a result of Russia's second invasion, this has managed to unite the country and the citizens have decided that they wanna be part of the West. They realize that they'll have better socioeconomic opportunities by being integrated with the West. And they also understand that, that organizations such as NATO provide defense security. And these are common people like you and me who are living there. This was an unprovoked war. They weren't harming anyone. They were trying to live their normal lives and instead their neighbors have invite, invaded them. And I think also this will be the downfall of Russian President Putin. His arrogance and his desire to have a lasting impact on history has driven him to make these catastrophic decisions. And he will be remembered in history as a Russian leader, but he will be remembered as the Russian leader who got Russia sanctioned more than any other country currently in the world. And perhaps it will lead to the downfall of what we now know as the Russian Federation. So if I can add on that, uh, and thank you for that question. It's a really great question. Um, my honest answer is that we don't know. Uh, and I hope definitely that Putin loses this regime. Um, what I want to add here is that one thing is certain that Putin has we'll find out from this war that it, it, Ukraine, as it thought he will run like a client state is absolutely, absolutely impossible. This is not going to happen. Um, this can, at least if not, you know, a rational minds prevail, uh, this might actually lead to a lasting peace in the region in terms of say, and people have been talking about it in the way Finland, for example, avoided that kind of confrontation in terms of neutrality. Um, but, uh, you know, on a much more ma macro level, if you see from the top, uh, perhaps we should go back and read uh, Thucydides and Peloponnesian War and look at uh, maybe this could be a vital moment to see if we are going to live in a unipolar world or is it a beginning of a multipolar world. Uh, but that's more a theoretical question than not from the war, but I hope Putin in spite of actually have killed off all his opposition or jailed them, uh, I hope he still loses uh, his, his power over Russia. I guess I would, uh, I guess I would say that I'm probably, well, first of all, I agree with Anurban. I have no idea what the future is. I've spent most of my career trying to understand the past and I've had problems with that. Uh, so trying to understand the future, predict the future is sort of beyond my uh, comfort zone. That being said, I'm probably more pessimistic than either Mark or Anurban. Uh, having lived uh, the bigger part of my life during the Cold War, I have fears that we could be returning to another Cold War with an iron curtain that is a bit further east than the last Cold War. 
And I also have some worries. Uh, some of you may be aware that in uh, 1994, uh, as a result of something called the Budapest Memorandum, uh, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. Uh, the nuclear weapons were uh, sent to, they were actually Soviet nuclear weapons, not really Ukrainian, but they were stationed on Ukrainian so soil and they were there when the Soviet Union fell apart. There were also uh, uh, nuclear weapons in uh, Belarus. And I have a fear that as a result of what's happened in Ukraine, that other countries will either be encouraged to develop nuclear weapons or be reluctant to move toward nuclear non-proliferation. And so I'm concerned that that could be a negative result among the other negative results of what has been going on uh, in Ukraine. Thank you to all of you. Before we close, I know we're getting close to <laughs> one o'clock. I'd like to invite Lemoyne's president, Dr. Lemura, she'd like to share a few um, closing thoughts with all of you. Well, I'd, I'd be delighted and uh, more to the point, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to do so. Um, professors, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Mark, um, there's something remarkably poignant about seeing you sitting adjacent on my screen to Professor Judge, since you, you did a lot of uh, study and work with him. I mean, this is, this is the beauty of what we do and watching uh, the impact of our amazing professors on the next generation. It's here for everyone to see. Um, I noticed something from our good uh, alumnus, Chris Balderson and friend of the college, kudos to Mark for his passion, action, communication skills, wisdom, hallmarks, of a Lemoyne education, amen to that. I couldn't agree more. And lastly, I'd like to say, thank you all for tuning in. Um, Lemoyne um, colleagues here on campus. I see members of Mark's, Mark's family here, member of the board of trustees, Kathy Forbush, people in the community, alumni from all the wonderful classes, uh, um, previous classes. I, it is such a joy for us to get together. I, I wish we were doing something other than talking about this sober topic, but um, this is this is what we do in the community. We come together to try to, to, to discuss complex problems and how we can contribute to ameliorating some of the suffering in the world. And Mark, continue your good work and your studying. You know that I will stay in touch with you. I love following your career. I, I take great pride and joy and Market, uh, like Professor Judd said, if we can get more students from the Ukraine uh, into our classrooms, uh, I will personally open the doors. So thank you all for joining us. And, and, and thank you, Chris, for, for hosting such a delightful session. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for that closing. Um, and just to echo Linda's um, gratitude, uh, of course, I wanna give a big thank you to Mark, um, Dr. Judge, uh, Dr. Acharya, you know, for sharing your collective wisdom with all of us today. And it was wonderful to see all of our alums on this phone call, some of our parents of students, um, my colleagues as well. And of course, having uh, Linda Lemura on board, that, that wonderful to see her and her participation. Um, so thank you to all of you for helping us uh, be better informed about this humanitarian crisis. Um, I know it's been weighing heavy on all of us. And as we've seen, um, it's really galvanizing us in many ways too on a global scale. So we're truly grateful to have all of you on this phone call or on this meeting with us today. And, and we're uh, truly grateful to have all of you great minds, um, Dr. Judge, Mark, and um, Dr. Acharya. So on behalf of Lemoyne College and the alumni engagement team, uh, thank you all for tuning in and being a part of this uh, critical conversation. And thank you for submitting all of your questions. I know that we couldn't get to all of them, um, but I will share the chat with our panelists. And I hope to see you again on, our, on one of our upcoming virtual programs.